Hi guys, Sharpo back once again, and this time I'm going to be reviewing the latest episode of Doctor Who. Doctor Who Season 6 started off with a bang, <laughs> I could say. I will warn you now, spoilers will be in effect, because as people who know me know quite well, I can't keep spoilers to myself a lot of the time. It's just too hard for me to skirt around the issue. It's easier just to tell you what the fuck happened. So if you don't know, if you don't want to know, if you don't like spoilers, please turn off. But I will be I won't be talking too in depth about the episode because I'll be honest, I don't know what the fuck happened. I really don't. Uh, so where to begin? I guess a synopsis would be in order. Have a drink. Okay, synopsis. Four envelopes, numbered. Two, three, and four. Each containing a date, time, and map reference. Unsigned, but TARDIS blue. Who sent them, and who received the missing envelope numbered one? This strange summons reunites the Doctor, Amy, Rory and River Song in the middle of the Utah desert and unveils a terrible secret the Doctor's friends must never reveal to him. Placing his life entirely in their hands, the Doctor agrees to search for the recipient of the fourth envelope and figure out just who is Canton Everett Delaware the third. Alright, yeah. I misread that wrong, so I'm I'm reading the synopsis from the TARDIS wiki. Also, what is the relevance of their only clue, Space 1969? Their quest lands them, quite literally, in the Oval Office, where they are enlisted by President Nixon to assist enigmatic former FBI agent Canton in saving a terrified little girl from a mysterious spaceman. Okay, right off the bat. It's a very good episode. It's a really, really strong start to the series. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I really did. It kept me engaged. It made me laugh. The humour and the dynamic between the actors is still present and it's very much still funny. I don't think... I don't think Matt Smith will ever not be funny as, do as the Doctor. He's just too damn entertaining. Uh. The pre-title sequence where we see what the, what was Rory's last name? Well, let's just say the Pons, <laughs> the newly wedded Amy and Rory are just hanging around their home, talking to each other, and it's intercut with scenes of the Doctor throughout history basically trying to get their attention <laughs> and they get the summons from the blue letter after that little scene we get uh, another look at the lovely River Song in the Storm Cage yet again so we, <laughs> we see her break out and how well, we don't see a breakout, but we do see that it actually worries the guards at the storm cage that she keeps getting out. <laughs> There's a guy on the phone who's like, um, she's doing it again, she's packing, I'm quite worried, and the alarm's blaring and there's armed guards. <laughs> oh. <laughs> see, I do like the character, she just looks old. And throughout these little bits, we get a kind of remixed version of the action theme that we had all through season five, and I love it. It's a great theme. It really suits the series as it is now. A real action-adventure kind of song. It's really fun. I don't know if you've noticed, but I do have my assistant, Gizmo. Say hello, Gizmo. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
really like the intro sequence it's pretty fun and of course we do get the line I wear a Stetson now Stetsons are cool yeah. <sighs> oh, you're off okay um, after the credits roll we get the doctor telling them why he's gathered them all together and it's to go on a picnic and while on that picnic he kind of lets slip that he's not what he appears to be he gives his age as 1103 I believe and at last count he was 908 so this doctor is 200 years older than the one we know so obviously something is going to happen to him and it does because while they're picnicking on the side of the lake a astronaut just appears he just appears in the water steps out the doctor approaches him warning his companions not to interfere and the astronaut kills him stone dead twice in the chest he begins regenerating and once more for the coup de gras and he's dead so <laughs> series over guys I'll see you around <laughs> no obviously this <laughs> it's really it's it's cool and it's not at the same time because we you know we know it's it's not going to be a big issue, really. Well, it's not going to have a major impact on the series because the Doctor isn't dead. At least the Doctor we know isn't dead. And this could just be a possible future for him. Um, so shocked by the death of their friend they are joined by one of the other envelope holders Canton Everett a sweet old man who brings a can of gasoline so they can burn his body <laughs> lovely man Amy, Rory and River convene back at the diner where they all met up and find the recipient of the fourth envelope with the number one on it and of course it's the doctor the 909 year old doctor to be exact <laughs> so yeah obviously the series will go on they convince him to go to 1969 to find out why they were all summoned and what have you and along the way the doctor quite literally says I'm taking you all home I'm not going to follow this plan because it's obviously a trap River Song asks him to just trust them and <laughs> in a nice play the doctor doesn't trust River he'll have a flirt with her and he really he likes her but it's obvious he doesn't trust her because he, she flat out refuses to say who she killed and why she's in the storm cage and I really like that it, it shows that the doctor is not just going to take the fact that she's a companion. She's, he's not going to take it as red. So, um, Amy convinces him to play along, despite the fact that she wants to tell him that he's going to die. And so, through a series of what <laughs> series of funny little bits in the TARDIS, they land in the Oval Office and meet President Nixon. Now, I really like the guy who plays Nixon because it's not a parody and it's a really good likeness. I mean, it's not like the, um, he, he looks like Nixon, he kind of sounds like Nixon, but it's not like that parody like in Futurama, so it's not a raving lunatic. He just sounds like a guy, he just sounds like President Nixon and that's fine, it, it's it's convenient for the plot. They're not trying to take a dig. Well, they do make a sly dig, but it's it's a funny little dig. But yeah, they 
meet with Nixon and it turns out he's been receiving phone calls from a scared little girl about this spaceman that's going to eat her. And obviously because it's a direct it's a direct phone call and it follows him wherever he is, he's kind of scared. So he enlists the help of the former FBI agent Canton. Who's played I think he's played by the guy who played Badger in Firefly. I don't know the actor's name, but I'm pretty sure it's him. With a really deep, gravelly voice that really doesn't suit him. He's all gruff and ready. He sounds a bit like Christian Bale. No, that's not fair. Not every voice is the deep, <laughs> growly Christian Bale voice. That's not fair. <laughs> but it is. It doesn't suit him. He's a little guy. And he, it really doesn't suit him. Um, and it's from there, from then on, they try and find this little girl, and it leads them to uh, an abandoned warehouse full of alien tech. They do meet the aliens in this first part. It is a two-part opener. I should, I don't think I, I mentioned that at the start, but it is a two-part opener. Um, it. <laughs> While investigating this abandoned office space that's full of alien tech and stuff from Cape Canaveral, like cutting edge, like space man stuff, astronaut stuff from that era. So we come to the aliens, and they're pretty cool. I like them. <laughs> the design is solid, the makeup's convincing. They've got a cool, like, men in black sort of thing going. I like their gimmick where if you see them you're obviously horrified but as soon as you you are not looking at them you forget all about them they literally edit themselves out of your memory it's quite a good defense mechanism almost it's really really cool thing I don't like about it oh the hands the hands are not convincing they look like um, they look like store bought Halloweeny alien hands, and they're really not very cool. Uh, while they're investigating this facility, they come across a console room, and I'm pretty sure it's the console room that they used in the season five episode, The Logic. So it's that weird kind of TARDIS control room. So I'm guessing that it belongs to these aliens. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe they're reusing the set design and hoping no one will notice. No idea. <laughs> and come the end of the episode, we get two big shockers. Well, three big shockers. One, we find out the little girl is inside the spacesuit. Two, we find out that Amy Pond is pregnant. And number three, Amy Pond shoots the little girl. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be interesting to see how that works out in the next episode. Because we know from the track record that the Doctor doesn't really like his companions using guns. Even at the best of times. So... <laughs> Seeing one of his companions gun down a little girl, even though it's kind of weird that she's in this full-sized astronaut suit, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So yeah, it's a really, really enjoyable episode. It's a strong opener. It does require at least two viewings. Because it, it, first time watching it through, it left me with a strong sense of what the fuck... But apart from that, really good episode. Can't wait for next week. And I hope to see you guys then. Take care.